Saria Rifts. It's nylon, not fiberglass. So, hey, I'm going to uh, paraphrase, if you don't mind, something you said on our Discord as we've been going through these videos. Quote uh -oh. Dan, this is a bad show. Me and my big mouth. Dan? No. <laughs> what oh, changed? Oh. oh, no, I was in a dark place. A dark place called uh, Season 1, Episode 4. Oh. No, not episode four. What is it? Episode five. Well, it's right. five, but in your head, I think that you think it's four because you made one and two one episode. Oh, that's right. Yeah, as as all two-parters should be, they are one episode. No, fair, yes. fair. It's an episode that I used to defend. Okay, so so you were specifically having uh, an un, an unpleasant response to the Between Friends episode. Oh, yes. What, what a disappointment. Like, such a disappointment of a book, but, oh boy... I, I love the how the uh, the episode decided so many things of the book were like extraneous to the plot and like we're gonna skim right over it and I'm like yeah that's that's what we need to do condense this nonsense into just its fundamental pieces get a get a nice little nose boop in and uh, call it a day <laughs> and uh, well as I watched it again I was like this is this is still incredibly slow love that line it's dolphin safe and everything only to realize they're referring to the show itself because no dolphins ever appear. Oh. <laughs> I believe the first meme I ever made for our reading group Discord was the collage of famous sophomore slumps, and it has, like, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and The Clash's second album mm -hmm. on there, and it has The Visitor. Those first several books are pretty solid. The Visitor is weird in that it doesn't really establish any lore, and then the apparent character development of Rachel, they basically abandon and do a much better job in her next book, book seven. So yeah, it's weird, of that introductory five, the visitor, like, you can just completely throw it away, and the episode kind of follows suit. <laughs> yes, I'd, I'd put this episode in the category of it was a good adaptation of the book, but still a terrible episode. All right. Which I don't think any other episode has that honor. Yeah, I'm like looking at all the others one where we're just like uh, bad adaptations or <laughs> <our> original scripts. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so some more deep lore. There was a sweepstakes where you could win a walk-on role on the show. I think I found the <gasps> walk-on. Okay, yeah, I remember this. I remember being like glued to the TV. Like they they didn't show the commercials that often. Yeah. And the first time I saw that I was like, oh, I gotta write this down immediately. Well, right. Didn't have anything recorded, and so I would just be watching all these all these bad Nickelodeon shows just with the hope I could find the commercial and oh, I'd write man. down the the contact information. I was obsessed. I I'd bet money on this one, man. I think I found it. Oh, okay. Who is it? It is season two, episode two. It's my name is Eric. It's after... Oh, 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 okay, I can guess. I can guess. Okay. It is when uh, Jake and Marco morph dogs, they go to the playground, and there's a kid petting the dog? No. You're a jerk! I think there's a good reason as to why it's not anybody in that scene. It's an exterior. It was done on location. After mm -hmm. the movie theater fiasco, they cut to Siberia. The camera basically locks on to the face of a young woman who's carrying like a duffel bag or something. Her face is on camera. It follows her as she walks across Siberia and goes out the door as Cassie and Rachel enter. Why would you go out of your way to plan a camera movement to show the face of an extra? And then it just hit me, wait, that's the perfect walk on because it's like your stage direction is to get up and leave the scene. Huh? Oh, that's not the only scene in the episode where you have a um, you have an actor's face fill up the entire screen, and they are just a, a non-speaking role. Because in the uh, in the movie theater sequence, right, Marco and Jake are uh, eaten away at the nachos, right, and then the woman looks down and sees them and then screams. Is and... it 
Okay, we're we're already headlong into these things where I don't really know enough about it to have an opinion, but I'm going to risk it anyway. Uh, I know there's a thing where basically if you speak, the pay scale and everything changes. I don't know if a screen counts, especially <laughs> since they can dub the screen. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, so I, ju- I just watched the, the scene. And I can see, yeah, it's right before Axe does his finger guns. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it has to establish that Axe is already, you know, there fiddling around with the TV before right. they walk in. So that way it's not a surprise when they're like, oh, hey, Axe. But yeah, it's like I the, the first thing that goes through my head when I see that, it's like, well, that might be uh, the duffel bag that she won in this contest. <laughs> oh, was there also a swag giveaway as well? <laughs> I don't even I, remember. I, I, I would assume there is, yeah. Although I'm sure it's unintentional, there's poetic symmetry in having the character walk on be in the adaptation of the android because there was a book sweepstakes <laughs> where somebody's name got to be canonized and it was Eric King, which is why Eric is spelled in a strange way. It was an actual, uh, at the time, like 12 year old boy named Eric King who won some essay contest and that's why the Chi has that name. You know what? That sounds so clever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm sure no one on the set thought of that. Oh hell no! Uh, <laughs> but uh, like it, it's also so beautiful. Come on, it's Christmas. Let me it it is one. it is a poetic nature of the universe that that happened. Though. Right now, that's not why I was watching this episode. So my other big reveal and some unfinished business from last time. I am pretty sure I know who was responsible for the multi-angle jump cuts. Oh right, who is it? The name of the individual is Rene Jorgakopoulos. Mm-hmm. I went through and took note of the directors, of which over the course of the series, there's like eight or ten of them, several editors as well. And I was just assuming that the tendency of the show to either do jump cuts where you make what should be a continuous motion, they split it up into like four or five, or in some cases, basically showing you the exact same movement from multiple angles. I figured that was the choice of one individual. And I couldn't find one name uh, that was consistent. Well, the person credited as the editor for episode 8, The Alien, which is completely without those cuts except for the Andalite arm fight sequence, I made a joke that, oh, this is the only episode where that editor is uh, credited. I'll bet you they fired him. And then I happened to notice that same name shows up as the assistant editor in every season 1 episode. In episode 8, she is also credited as the assistant editor. So she was her own assistant for that. Here, Here's the real, uh, the smoking gun for me. As weirdly directed and as different as uh, the couple season two episodes we got are, she is not the assistant editor for, um, for My Name is Eric and for The Front. It never happens in those two episodes. The memory that I'm I'm getting is that you did have uh, more of the the fake slow mo. Um, That's the, there is there is fake point. there is fake slow mo in these episodes. Although it's weird. As much as I hate it, I think that one's a little bit more forgivable. They used the fake slow mo specifically to signal someone is morphing off camera so often that I felt like even if they hated it as much as I did, they were kind of married to it. Mm -hmm. But the jump cut of vision goes away in season two at the same time that that assistant editor isn't there. And now I get the feeling that there's there's a lot of jobs like this where like the assistant is actually the one doing most of the work and the one who, you know, gets the top line credit is basically the one who had to rubber stamp it i just thought of a um of a multi-angle sequence in changes why do you have to call me out (laughs) for as much time as i spent (laughs) discussing changes last time it's so long and so hard for me to watch that i didn't watch it again and it's it's a different style and it it almost feels like it's alluding to this but it's like no we're gonna we're gonna do this multi-angle style and we're gonna do it right this time Uh. ah because i almost i almost like the shot Okay. So we're in the, they're in the food court and they're going on their mission to find Harold Nesbitt. And they're, they're all, you know, standing around the circle over by the, uh, the mall's uh, logo on the floor. And you see the establishing shot of them down on the floor. It zooms in and then it cuts them uh, and it cuts to the camera looking up at them. Okay, yeah. Zoom in and then it, it's down mm-hmm. and they're going in the circle. Yep. Hey! An uninterrupted cut of it going around them, although from the center (laughs) out. Oh, okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> that is uh, not. They did it. They did it right. It, that it, is it, not. You know, the they same. tried it in the first episode. They tried to do the circle around in the first episode cafeteria scene. It didn't work. And now here they go in the finale. They did it and they succeeded. Yeah. I've tried to find any kind of behind the scenes info on this show, especially with the production people. And I can't find anything. I like, know everyone has amnesia about this show. The only one I'm aware <laughs> of is the one that you actually linked, uh, I think more than a year ago at this point where they did a fairly extended interview around 2010, uh, with director and occasional writer for the show, Ron Oliver. Um, you're leading me to what I can see is like the actual fight between the director and the DP and the people who are actually on set versus the behind the scenes people who got the footage afterwards. I, I swear in some of these episodes, I can see them fighting. And this is potentially <laughs> an example. Last time I complained about the fake slow-mo. They obviously filmed everything at the standard video rate of 29.97 frames and then just artificially slowed it down. Uh, and they do that all the time. I was shocked and then delighted and then confused when I found instances of real slow-mo in the show. So this means there were instances where the director decided, okay, we're going to film the scene in slow-mo. Many, many more instances of the editor or someone in pro post-production going, no, uh, go ahead and make this jerky because I need this to last a few seconds longer. Including my favorite one, which I still kind of don't believe. In episode 7, The Escape, the oatmeal reveal. <laughs> it's like a, oh it's like gosh, a yes. half a second <laughs> shot where Cassie pulls the bag of oatmeal like halfway out of the bag to go like, how are we going to get this into the yerk pool? And they do fake slow-mo on the reveal. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. <laughs> so anyway, the first instance of real slow-mo, and this is Ron Oliver directing, and this is where I feel like he had room in the teleplay or whatever, so decided to do a quick student film project. It's when they're getting ready to go into the Yerk Pool. You have shots of the empty school, which fades into the full school, and then the Animorphs join and merge into the line. That was filmed in real slow-mo. So the director decided this is how it's going to look. The next episode, On the Run, mm -hmm. same director. This one's actually kind of uncomfortable. The uh, muscular, slicked back hair, Jersey Shore looking controller who goes into the pet store. He's doing a power walk down the mall hallway. <laughs> that was filmed in real slow mo. And that, this is interesting. Between <laughs> friends, different director, the final sequence, the hallway walk and talk between Rachel and Melissa, also done in real slow mo. I think uh, that the, the, um, the scene in the mall with the controller. Uh, walking down to to get the the andalite turning himself in mm -hmm. i'm sure that was an actor's choice <laughs> i'm sure the actor said to the director you know what you need to make me look good give me a power this walk is how you do it oh yeah <laughs> i have a fan theory that they had to dub his dialogue afterwards because he's wearing the nylon pants that i also had in 1998 and let me tell you everything <laughs> oh, you did God. in those pants you do yes <laughs> <laughs> Boy, it was great sitting at a desk in sixth grade and having to, like, get a pencil. <laughs> so I, I like to imagine that, you know, wardrobe dresses him like that, you know, courtesy of the Gap, and then it ruined all of his audio. Yeah. <laughs> like, the boom mic just picked up his pants the whole time. Nylon. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> oh, my God. I hope, I hope there is one individual out in the world who could enjoy this as much as I enjoy talking about this garbage. So I got some, some trivia for you. Okay. Okay. And I went looking to see if I could find all the instances in the show where you have multiple actors playing the same role. Okay. Right. And I was able to come up with four. I'm wondering if you can name them. Go ahead. Crap, it depends. Does Sean and Aaron oh. Ashmore count? Because I think Aaron Ashmore, when yep. he appears, is actually Axe. I'm not sure, though. <gasps> oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, did I? Did oh, this I just going to make this is this is going to make great trivia though for later. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so works. for so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, th this was I think I, was this in the book? Was this in Meet the Stars? I don't know why this information is in my brain. But it, it, oh yeah, there there was something in Meet the Stars. About okay, yeah. so Sean Ashmore has an identical twin, Aaron, who has also appeared in other things, and for the shot where Jake has to confront himself uh, in the capture, they used Sean Ashmore's identical twin. I don't know which shot it is, though. So 
I don't know if they wanted to keep Aaron from having to have a line in the thing. If that's the case, when there's the zoom in, hello, Jake. If that's Sean on the reverse playing Axe and Aaron is the body double, then that means Jake was played by two actors. But if it's Sean saying hello, Jake, then that means Jake is always Sean. Everybody got that? You know, it's it's funny. There's uh, fan speculation that um, Sean's brother was playing the role of Jake as Axe. Like in the artichoke scene or whatever? Yep. Yeah, and and so I looked back and I try and I tried to pick that apart, you know, bit by bit. I really do think that is Sean. However, it's entirely possible that it was Aaron Ashmore. I think it might it, it has the potential to be him on the bridge. Uh, yeah. When, when they're talking about sports and girls. You yeah. Know, right. You know, I thought on watching that scene that like his face looks like it has a slightly different shape to it, but I realized he's doing an impression of how Axe speaks. So possibly the best acting in the whole series, man, because I, I think it is Sean. Oh, yeah. And again, do do they credit Aaron Ashmore? <gasps> so so he could have done the voiceover for both the bridge sequence, but then also for the hello, Jake. Right. So, Basically, yeah. I think every time he speaks, but he has that affectation, it's Sean trying to hold his face and speak the way Paula Costanzo plays Axe. But no, I, I'm pretty sure now that I think it through that they use Aaron as the body double for Jake and not for Axe as Jake. So there you go. So that's all that's all one. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. So so I was kind of accidentally mixing it up and confusing. Yeah. Jake and Axe as two. OK, so there's three. OK. Um, are you counting the changing picture of Marco's mom? Yes. Okay. Ah, you got it. Yep. <laughs> OK. So when it when the camera in episode three pans over and you see the picture of, you know, the happy family, Marco's mother is not the actress they ultimately cast to play her when you see the picture in the drawer. Mm -hmm. Correct. So now the question is, is that the same actor from the picture in the alien? Oh, shoot. So there, so you're saying there might be three of them? Uh, possibly. I haven't done side by side comparison. But yeah, so so it it's is. like it's it's probably going to be one or the other. The question right. is, okay, is it the the first one or is it the actual? Uh, actor? You know what? While I'm queuing up that scene, why don't you talk about how bananas the scene itself is, if you don't mind the quick diversion? Absolutely. Okay, so I I love the scene in the alien with the picture. This is something that always stood out to me as a kid. I always remembered that as being a, a standout scene in the series. It's like, oh, this touching moment of, oh, yes, we, we put the picture in the drawer because if it's just hanging up on the wall, you ignore it after a while. And every time you open up the drawer, though, the, then you see it and then you're reminded of her. And I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. That's so adorable. And watching it through this time, all I could think is, why are they putting wax fruit in the drawer? <laughs> the drawer. Yeah. What, what happened? I, I forgot. Did did you say anything to cue me into that, or did I notice it basically organically? And you know what? No, you that... you just noticed it, and I, don't, and I was I was like, no, now the scene is forever ruined. <laughs> and yeah, the way they block the scene is Axe comes in, sees a bowl of fruit, grabs it, and tries to eat it, which relative to Axe and food, that's actually one of the most appropriate assumptions he ever makes. <laughs> he doesn't take a bite of it, but then Marco goes to hide that specific piece of wax fruit in a drawer rather than putting it back on, back in the bowl, because that's that blocking is the excuse to get him to open the drawer and encounter the photo. Uh, it's like, did, did he want to hide it from Axe? Like, it's, like don't eat so this he, so piece he wouldn't of eat fruit it again. again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to, I'm going to buy some wax fruit. And I'm going to put it in the drawer. And just so every time I open up the drawer, I can think of this scene. So two things. The mm -hmm. picture in the drawer is definitely the actress who plays Visser 1. I want to say Eva, but being pedantic, they never name her in the uh, in the TV show. Mm -hmm. That looks like a wax tomato. I mean, the resolution in this show was garbage to begin with, but I, I don't even, like. That can't be right. Who would put a wax tomato in a bowl of fruit? Well, some people just really like the look of tomatoes. Fruit. Uh, I'm trying to think of who the other likely suspects might be. They don't ever recast any parents. They don't... I don't think it's any this of the This is probably aliens. the most traditional recasting of the set. <laughs> that I'm just completely forgetting? <laughs> yep. Uh, I remember because it bummed me out when I first saw it. I was like, oh no, not him. Uh, I didn't want to see him change. It's not Elfangor, is it? No, nope. help me, help nope, me out. That's the same voice. Uh, you're close. 
Oh, oh, man. dude, does that count? <laughs> you're, you're this about, or three? You're talking he about Eugene absolutely Lipinski. is. He is absolutely played by both Eugene Lipinski and Tom Barnett. Does it count when it's a different morph? Because like it, the thought speak voice is still Lipinski, isn't it? Oh, I think it was modulated. Oh. Uh. I think it was it was an impression, and they said, "Well, okay, since it's thought speak, we can kind of okay. mess it up enough." Yeah. Okay, so he left the show. Yeah, and there's speculation that they even did that uh, as early as the pilot, even before they cast Eugene. They they might have said, "Okay, let's do this kind of generic bad guy voice," and then yeah, get an actor to mimic. That's something. Else. So he so Lipinski's not credited in the pilot. There's a weird accent, Prince of Fangor. Prince of Fangor. When you first hear him speak, it's so silly. Uh, so yeah, I, mm-hmm. I actually think Visser Three is played by three people then. Possibly. Okay. And <laughs> There's there, no and way of knowing. Now hang on. Other than Visser Three, the show only ever depicts one other successful human morph, which means actually there's three actors who play Jake. Tom's actor plays Jake. I, in I knew Face I was Off. forgetting something. <laughs> So I, I did have another another character that just immediately came to mind, and then I thought, it's like, oh, no, if I include this one, I have to include every character who who morphs, um, if I if I include their their animals. So I'll just ask you this, then, mm. for, for this last one. What are all the portrayals of Tobias? Every time you hear his voice, it's Christopher <laughs> Ralph. When he shows up in person, it's Christopher Ralph. Correct. Yep. So. So. So of of all the him. uncredited uh, types of appearances of him, yeah, no, it's it's <laughs> not it's not right to say he's replaced by a hawk. Correct. Mm-hmm. Oh man, what? I lost the disc. 